Good afternoon and welcome. It's a pleasure to celebrate Risa Galyabov's appointment to the John Allen Love Professorship. The chair was established in 1982 to honor Mr. Love, who attended the law school from 1905 to 1907 without taking a degree, and then founded several financial services companies before his death in 1974. Jeff O'Connell was the inaugural chairholder, followed by George Rutherglen and Dan Ortiz. The current John Allen Love professor, Risa Galyabov, holds an undergraduate degree from Harvard, an MA and PhD in history from Princeton, and a JD from Yale. After law school, she clerked for Judge Guido Calabresi on the Second Circuit, and then for Justice Breyer, before joining our faculty in 2003. In her time here, she has, she has established herself as one of the leading young legal historians in the nation, receiving a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Burkhart Fellowship, as well as being named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. Reese's scholarship focuses on 20th century American legal and constitutional history with a focus on civil rights. A consistent theme running through her work is contingency. She rejects determinist views of civil rights history and shows that the choices that advocates, judges, and interested parties made affect the way we view civil rights today. This outlook is evident in her celebrated first book, The Lost Promise of Civil Rights. Risa shows that the complaints that African Americans brought to lawyers, courts, and federal agencies in the pre-Brown era were much broader than school segregation and lack of meaningful access to the ballot. Instead, many focused on their ability to earn a living in the agricultural sector in the South and the industrial sector in northern cities. Moreover, the complaints were often aimed at the practices of employers and labor unions, not just governments. Risa carefully shows how a wide range of choices by lawyers, nonprofits, particularly the NAACP, and government agencies shaped the questions that ended up before the federal courts and therefore the range of potential judicial innovations. She focuses in particular on how it came to be that the iconic challenge to Jim Crow involved school segregation and not economic issues. Seen from the standpoint of the 1930s and 1940s, the focus on state-mandated segregation was not inevitable. In prior work, Risa pointed out that the 13th Amendment's ban on involuntary servitude could, and sometimes did, form a basis for challenging peonage or agricultural service mandated by the terms of a loan. But the focus of civil rights litigation shifted over time as a result of litigation strategy, not necessarily as a result of legal doctrine. The most consequential decisions were to focus on state action rather than private arrangements and to focus on non-economic rights. These claims had particular resonance for the lawyers involved in litigating civil rights cases who came mostly from an educated urban elite. As these lawyers tried successfully to build a constituency among African Americans in northern cities, they began to focus less on the concerns of African Americans working in agriculture. Like all great history, the book constantly inspires us to ask, what if? In particular, I wonder whether economic rights would have become the constitutional orphans they are today had they played a central role in seminal civil rights cases. Not surprisingly, the book garnered substantial attention and acclaim, winning the prestigious James Willard Hurst Prize, as well as the Order of the Coif Biennial Book Award. Reese's current work focuses on the decline of vagrancy laws. As with her first book, most of the action takes place outside the Supreme Court and well before the court found various vagrancy statutes unconstitutional, in 1971 and 1972. Restricting the mobility of laborers, particular, particularly agricultural laborers, is a common policy in many societies from medieval and early modern Europe to modern day China. Reese's analysis of how those policies died in the United States will therefore have much to teach us, and I look forward to hearing what she has to say about the project today. Please join me in welcoming the John Allen Love Professor of Law, Risa Galyabov.
I was asked if I needed anything special, and a stool did not come to mind, but I think we'll be okay. Thank you, Paul, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming. I know that there are a lot of demands on your time, and I appreciate your being here. It's an honor to serve as the John Allen Love Professor of Law, and as I talk about uh, the 1960s, we can all laugh about being the Love Professor. Um, so my colleagues have heard me talk about parts of the book project that form the base of this talk uh, too many times, um, but I hope that this is the first time that uh, many of you will hear about the whole book as opposed to parts of it, and I hope that there's enough new here to keep the old hands interested and enough background to make sense to those hearing about it for the first time. One of the many times that I discussed this book project uh, with my colleagues was when I talked about my methodological approach to constitutional history, what I call the new constitutional history. I didn't make it up, but I, I, it is a new constitutional history in response to an old one that focused almost exclusively on the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and as uh, Dean Mahoney already said, one of the things that I do is look at the process of law creation and legal change outside of the court. So one characteristic of the new constitutional history is that it's less linear. It doesn't start and end with one or more Supreme Court cases, although it still includes the Supreme Court. But it also includes other judges, lawyers, litigants, and other lay people, social movements, academics, politicians, government officials, and journalists. And in this talk that I gave to my colleagues a couple of years ago, I talked about how hard it was to figure out where to start writing a particular chapter. I even gave a poll to see if my colleagues could help me figure out where to start, right? Because if your goal is to include all the multiple actors who are a part of this process, then which actor do you start with? So if it's a problem that I have when I write an individual chapter, you can imagine how hard it is to figure out where to begin in a 40-minute talk about the entire book. So it makes me want to start in several places at once. I'm tempted to start this way. For the first time in 1952, the Supreme Court took a case to determine whether a vagrancy law was constitutional. The case came out of 1949 Los Angeles, and it involved one Isidore Edelman, a soapbox orator in Los Angeles's Pershing Square. He was a communist, although he had been kicked out of the Communist Party for being too idiosyncratic. Uh, but he stood in the square every day. He actually had a commute. He, he crossed Los Angeles on, on a bus to go to Pershing Square to join all the other soapbox orators. And people at his trial testified having heard him speak for 800 times. Uh, I, I mean, this was what he he did. He, he spoke in Pershing Square about all kinds of um, communist-related topics, and he was repeatedly arrested. He was arrested 63 times for things like begging, soliciting funds, distributing handbills, and my favorite is that he was arrested for defacing a park bench by standing on it, a park bench of the big, thick, concrete kind, by standing on it. And then he was arrested for vagrancy. Vagrancy laws and related suspicious persons and loitering laws, which I'll group for our purposes uh, under the heading of vagrancy laws, came, as uh, Dean Mahoney mentioned, from medieval and Elizabethan England to the colonies with the colonists, and they proliferated across the states until pretty much every state uh, or locality had a vagrancy law on the books for centuries. And there were two hallmarks of vagrancy laws that made them particularly useful to law enforcement uh, authorities and local officials. The first was that they were status offenses. So most laws that we think of criminalize conduct, um, and it, you, you can uh, rob a bank, and then you can be convicted of bank robbery. But vagrancy laws can, um, often criminalize being a particular type of person. So I'm going to read to you from the Jacksonville ordinance that was on the books in 1972 that the Supreme Court struck down in the seminal case. And this isn't the whole thing. This is just part of it. Rogues and vagabonds, or dissolute persons who go about begging, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, common night walkers, thieves, pilferers or pickpockets, traders in stolen property, common railers and brawlers, persons wandering or strolling around from place to place without any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons, shall be deemed vagrants, not 
if you engage in these things, you will be, you will commit the crime of vagrancy, you shall be deemed vagrant. So if you were one of these types of people, you could be arrested on site, even if at that moment you were not loafing, or even if at that moment you were not doing anything particularly disorderly. And this leads to the second uh, hallmark of vagrancy laws that made them so useful, which is that they were quite vague and they were quite broad. They gave virtually unlimited discretion to law enforcement officers to arrest virtually anyone at any time. You can figure out how to put somebody under uh, one of those headings. Someone was once uh, arrested for wandering about with no apparent purpose when he had been sitting on a bus stop bench for several hours before the police arrested him. So he was not wandering and had not been in the, in the recent past. Um, so for centuries, officials employed vagrancy laws against anyone who is out of place in any way, hence my title, people out of place, and not just those you might think of as vagrants when I say the word. They used vagrancy laws variously to regulate and extract labor from the resident poor, exclude and punish poor strangers, incapacitate apparent threats to social order, prevent the commission of incipient crime, enforce racial segregation and subordination, and discipline minorities, dissidents, and conformists of all stripes. Isidore Edelman obviously fit into this last category. He was a communist thinker at the height of the Cold War. The section of the California vagrancy law under which he was convicted said that anyone who was dissolute was a vagrant. They defined dissolute as lawless. Edelman had been arrested before, therefore he was lawless, therefore he was dissolute and a vagrant. The Supreme Court agreed to hear his case. It was, as I said, the first time that they considered a traditional vagrancy law, but before they decided the case, they dismissed it as improvidently granted in the, in the language of the court. They digged it, dismissed it as improvidently granted. Over the next 20 years, they took about a dozen vagrancy-related cases and either dismissed them or got rid of them on narrow grounds and avoided the constitutional uh, question. Perhaps surprisingly, it was not the Warren court, the liberal court that we think of as engaging in constitutional rights creation and real constitutional change. It wasn't the Warren court that struck down vagrancy laws. It wasn't until Warren Burger was chief justice in 1972, uh, and 1971 and 1972, that the court finally invalidated such laws. The justice who wrote the decisions, William O. Douglas, was a holdover. He'd been one of the most liberal of the Warren court justices, but the case was unanimous. There's a little footnote to the unanimous because justice as Powell and Rehnquist were uh, confirmed, uh, were on the court, but they had not been on the court for the oral argument, and so they did not vote in the case. But th by the time the case came to the court, uh, the contingency aside, it seemed like the downfall of the vagrancy laws was so inevitable that uh, uh, at least one newspaper reported that even had Rehnquist and Powell been on the court, it still would have been unanimous, which I think is an open question, but they thought so at least. Um, so the case was called Papa Christu v. City of Jacksonville and involved the uh, ordinance that I just read to you, and there were eight defendants of various types involved in the case. The most prominent of those eight defendants were two black men and two white women on a double date in Jacksonville, Florida in 1969, and they were convicted of vagrancy by prowling by auto. Now, I told you, I didn't read you the whole Jacksonville ordinance, but prowling by auto was not a type of vagrancy listed there, but that didn't seem to stop anyone. My book and this talk is about what happened between Edelman and Papa Christou. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, vagrancy laws move from a status of constitutional legitimacy to constitutional illegitimacy. By this, I don't mean that everyone before the 1950s thought vagrancy laws were constitutional or legitimate. That was certainly not the case, nor do I mean to say that everyone accepted their legitimacy, their illegitimacy after 1972, particularly law enforcement and local government officials were scrambling to figure out how to find laws that as closely approximated vagrancy laws as possible um, without going afoul of Papa Christou, and they certainly didn't all accept the legitimacy of the Supreme Court's case. But by 1971 and 1972, there is a sea change in the constitutional status of vagrancy laws as understood by the Supreme Court of the United States. And the question of my book is how did that change happen? How does something legitimate for hundreds, of, for hundreds of years become illegitimate over the course of 20? And there's a secondary question that I'll get to later on, which is what happened in the aftermath? What do we make of that transformation? So that's introduction number one. As an introduction, 
that would be fine as far as it goes. It represents the narrative framing of my book, but it only goes so far toward representing the story that I'm telling. It's too linear, it's too focused on the Supreme Court, and it's too triumphalist. Good, the end of vagrancy laws, triumphs over evil, discriminatory and abusive policing. It's too reminiscent of the old constitutional history. And most importantly, I think, it's too divorced from the people who lived under the threat and reality of vagrancy arrests. The humanity of the story is missing. So let me try again. Introduction number two. I'll start with some folks you have never heard of, save one or two, Isadora Edelman and Margaret Papacristo already, your experts. I want you to meet a number of other people. Shuffling Sam Thompson, a handyman and junk peddler, an alcoholic and African American. He's the target of constant police harassment, usually at the Louisville bus station. He goes one night to avoid the police harassment at the bus station to a tavern to wait for his bus. And I, I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. The name of the tavern is the Liberty End Cafe because it's at the end of Liberty and West Streets. Uh, and uh, the police go there looking for him and they arrest him in the tavern, in the Liberty End Cafe for the 55th time as he was uh, eating some macaroni and shuffling his feet to the jukebox. And the precise nature of his shuffling was an issue during the Supreme Court oral argument, and so that's why he gets dubbed Shuffling Sam Thompson. Uh, also meet the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was, uh, according to a Supreme Court opinion, quote, a notorious person in the field of civil rights in Birmingham. He was co-founder with Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He was arrested for loitering when he refused to vacate a street corner on which he was talking to a few colleagues during a boycott of downtown department stores in Birmingham in the spring of 1962. Meet Joy Kelly, a young hippie in Charlotte, North Carolina, who rented a house to serve as a crash pad for she and her friends, for her and her friends. She was arrested uh, along with 18 people after intense police harassment of the hippie house, day in and day out, in the middle of the night, lights shining in the house. Arrested with 18 people in her house for vagrancy, and she was told after her arrest that if she ever returned to the house that she had rented, she would be arrested again. Meet also Stephen Wainwright, a Tulane law student who was unlucky enough to resemble a murder suspect when he went out for a midnight bite to eat in the French Quarter. This story should be a lesson to all of you law students out there. He resembled this murder suspect. The murder suspect had a tattoo that said, born to raise hell on his arm. And when the police confronted Wainwright, they asked to see his arm. He refused. He refused in part because he had a, a skin disease and he was embarrassed. And he refused in part because he was a law student and he knew his rights. He was arrested for vagrancy. Martin Hershorn is the last person I want to introduce you to now. Uh, he had dressed as a woman since he was 17. At age 19, he was a hairstylist in Manhattan. The police uh, found him in his home wearing only a half slip and a brassiere, and they arrested him under an old law, uh, uh, a, a law that uh, originated uh, with the folks Chuck McCurdy writes about in the 19th century in New York, and they arrested him under this law that made anyone masquerading in public so as to conceal his identity a vagrant. These folks are obscure, unconnected, and very different from one another. They are white and black, men and women, arrested in public and private, arrested for political protests and seeming like a murderer, arrested for their sexuality or their poverty or their long hair. They made different constitutional claims, free speech and association, criminal procedure claims of all kinds, cruel and unusual punishment claims, involuntary servitude, discrimination, privacy, and other fundamental rights. Their differences show the kaleidoscope that was vagrancy regulation, its ubiquity, its flexibility, its use as an ever-present police tool to keep people in their imagined places. These folks are a big part of the answer to the question of my book, how did vagrancy laws lose their legitimacy? A big part of the answer to that question is that these people and people like them began making vagrancy laws and their uses visible by bringing cases against them. Vagrancy challenges come over the long 1960s, between the early 1950s and the early 1970s, is how I'm defining my period. From African Americans and other civil rights activists, communist labor union members, poor people, beats and hippies, gay men, lesbians, and other sexual minorities, women, Vietnam War protesters, student activists, young urban minority men, and other dissidents. Folks who had been regulated by vagrancy laws are now organized, assertive, and this is key, they have lawyers. 
and they find that vagrancy laws are obstacles to their other goals, whether those other goals be sexual freedom, racial equality, or political protest. It's no coincidence that representatives of most of the major social movements of the time were involved in the vagrancy challenge. If you can't walk down the street without being arrested on site, remember vagrancy laws are status crimes, then other rights are hard to vindicate. Another way of putting this point is that police officers, as much as legislatures, hindered the goals of social movements of the 60s, and they were seen equally to need intervention. So that's introduction number two. It's better methodologically. It gets at the history of vagrancy law by identifying law in the everyday life of everyday people. Change comes, as historians like to say, from below, from regular people recognizing enforcement of these laws as constitutionally problematic or potentially constitutionally problematic and seeking redress. It's better, but it's not yet right. These stories are too disconnected. They're too disparate. Where are the sinews, the networks, the connections, other than my own abstract conceptualization that bring them together? My third attempt, then. Introduction number three is my last attempt, and then I'll conclude. Many of us at Google, straight from introduction to conclusion, many of us know the story of Brown versus Board of Education, right? A band of lawyers in the NAACP methodically challenged segregation and won. Uh, as Dee Mahoney said, this is what my first book was about, and in part it showed that that was an oversimplification in many ways, but the core of the NAACP campaign remained, and that model of legal change has become really quintessential. If you think about the way people talk about the marriage equality campaign today, it's all really based on the idea that people get together and they go out and they create this legal campaign. That's not how it happened in this book. This book is also about legal and constitutional change the challenge to the constitutionality of vagrancy laws. But it's not coordinated in New York or Washington. It's incremental, loosely networked. It's a correlated set of actions by a whole host of actors. Vagrancy cases popped up everywhere. They weren't the product of one person or one organization proselytizing or organizing or colonizing to make their vision happen. They resulted from the aggregate energy of lawyers across the country facing down similar but different laws in similar but different circumstances again and again. So if you imagine Brown, the Brown model, as kind of like a 1950s high school prom. It's organized, it's fixed, and it's known even if it's contingent in many of its particulars. The vagrancy challenge, says the love professor, is more like a 1960s happening. No one really planned it, the guest list was unwritten, the entertainment self-created, the location, duration, and content relatively spontaneous and open. When I first realized this, I was troubled by the lack of central coordination, because I, too, had imbibed the idea that a, a legal campaign had to have a central coordinator. But now I realize that this is a different model, and an equally important one. I won't go so far as to say a more important one, I haven't decided yet, but at least equally important. The vagrancy challenge, the challenge that provokes 250 reported cases in a decade without central coordination, reveals a legal regime that is so pervasive, so centrally important to the maintenance of a certain kind of order and hierarchy in American society, that every, every social movement of the era runs smack into it and tries to push it over. This introduction then pushes us to examine how people came to see the vagrancy challenge as a single thing. How lawyers came to show judges that vagrancy problems of disparate people in disparate circumstances were actually connected. So in this introduction, I want you to meet some other folks, the lawyers. Meet Al Weirin and Fred Okrand, who represented Isidore Edelman, our soapbox orator. They were affiliated with the Southern California ACLU. Weirin had first encountered vagrancy laws in the 1930s when defending California farm workers against growers as they tried to organize. And Okrand would still be defending uh, uh, folks against California's revamped loitering law as late as 1983, for those of you who know, in the case of Colander v. Lawson, uh, when the law was used against an African-American man who had a habit of walking around around a white neighborhood. So between them, Weirin and Okren spanned a half century of vagrancy challenges involving questions as wide ranging as labor, the farm workers, free speech, Isidore Edelman, and race, Colin V. Lawson. Meet also Ernest Bessig. He was the head of the Northern California ACLU that had quite a rivalry, not over vagrancy cases, but over other things. Where Weirin and Okren faced uh, different vagrancy defendants at different moments, Bessig simultaneously responded to complaints in the 1950s San Francisco from Beats, 
gay men and lesbians, and African Americans. And he understood earlier than most how useful vagrancy was as a tool to any threat that might appear. And finally, meet Anthony Amsterdam. He published a paper on why vague laws were unconstitutional while still in law school. This is a throwing down a gauntlet to those of you out there, that would structure much of the lawyerly and judicial thinking about vagrancy laws for decades. It's still, I think, one of the most cited law review articles of all time. Law school, he wrote it in like three weeks. Uh, it suggested that laws that were too vague were problematic both because they didn't give enough guidance to people to know how to avoid criminal behavior and because they didn't give enough guidance to law enforcement officials to avoid arbitrary or discriminatory enforcement. Amsterdam moved between the academy and practice. He worked mostly with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, but also with the ACLU. He brought his vagrancy expertise to bear in the civil rights struggle, in the Vietnam War protests, cases and in the criminal procedure cases that caused the justices their main hiccup in trying to figure out what to do about vagrancy laws. These and other lawyers began with discrete problems brought to them by other people, but they began to see connections between these cases and they gradually built on arguments about the protean nature of vagrancy laws, about the commonality of the various groups regulated by them. In thinking about the lawyers, we get to another part of the answer to the question of why. Why did this happen? How does legal change happen over this period? And that is that changing legal developments from the period that were related to, caused by, facilitative of the various social movements were also happening at the time. There were new visions of the First Amendment and free speech, of policing, criminal justice, and the protection of defendants' due process rights, of the role of the substantive criminal law in maintaining crime control as opposed to social control of labor and poverty, what causes poverty, how people should be or should not be required to participate in the labor market, of pluralism, nonconformity, and privacy, and of anti-discrimination and equality. The book shows how all of these various strands of legal, social, and intellectual history come together in the vagrancy attack. So that's introduction number three. And again, it works as far as it goes. It shows how lawyers served as mediators as gate and gatekeepers, how they were acted as centers of networks and movers of information, norms, politics, and culture, as well as law across actors, regions, and legal processes. But lawyers still are not the whole story. Each of these beginnings is a false start, for the real story must put them all together. And that is what my book does, two things that historians haven't done before. First, I construct a history of American vagrancy laws and their constitutional downfall. And second, I use vagrancy laws history as a lens into the legal history of the long 1960s. Vagrancy laws were a key part of the establishment that had to fall for the 60s social movements to achieve their goals. And the demise of vagrancy laws both propelled and reflected the larger changes of the era. To tell these stories then, I move both across social movements and types of vagrancy victims and also up and down the legal process from defendant to lawyer to justice and back again as well as all the other actors involved in the process. In each chapter in my book, I show a new group of lay people confronting how they are regulated by vagrancy law and then show the kinds of arguments that legal professionals increasingly make to connect these various and disparate groups. It was not obvious in 1952 that vagrancy cases of a communist soapbox orator, a Skid Row alcoholic, a hippie, a transvestite, a genuine transvestite as he was called in the case, or a civil rights leader had much in common. But that is what the lawyers argued. And you would see, even in cases without a real First Amendment component, the lawyers would cite the First Amendment. Even in cases where race was not an issue, they would try to make race an issue. Over the course of the 20 years, as the court kept taking these cases and dismissing them or finding ways to deal with them narrowly, it continually saw new arguments, new uh, contexts, new litigants. And so the process was largely one of analogy and connection from social context to legal argument to new social context and back again. And by the time Papa Christou came to the court, the court was already familiar with many uh, types of vagrancy victims. Papa Christou itself collected a bunch. Margaret Papa Christou and her friends on their double date were the most famous of the eight defendants, but not the only ones. 
Uh, and they showed, what they showed was that the court understood that the police were doing something that the court had only recently said legislatures couldn't do. So two years before Papa Christo was arrested, the court in Loving versus Virginia strikes down Virginia's anti-miscegenation law. Um, so here you have police officers trying to regulate interracial sexual mores, and the court says, no, you can't do that. Uh, when Papa Christo was, uh, was at the police station, uh, someone from the police station called her parents and said, do you know that your daughter was out with a black woman? I mean, it was quite clear uh, uh, from the proceedings why uh, the four was arrested. But they weren't the only ones. The lawyer who brought the case was looking for a vagrancy case, and he had watched the court avoid answering the constitutional questions in case after case for years. And he had said to himself, I'm going to put everybody in there so that the court can't avoid answering this question. So in addition to them, he had some poor people looking for jobs. He had an NAACP organizer. He had some young men who seemed they, they were clearly up to some criminal behavior, even if it couldn't be proven. And that's why they were arrested for vagrancy laws. And he succeeded. The Supreme Court justices eventually saw these commonalities, especially Justice Douglas, who wrote the opinion. And the court struck down this vagrancy law, announcing that it was no longer constitutionally legitimate. So I seem to have told much of the story of this book over the course of setting forth my three possible introductions. So having gotten past the introduction by failing to choose one, uh, now finally at last and 20 minutes in, I'm ready to conclude. But don't, 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 don't worry, I'm not, I'm not done yet. I mean, maybe you would love me to be done. But I'm going to warn you, just because I say conclude, it doesn't mean it's over. Papa Christu, of course, is not the end of the story, far from it. The Supreme Court is never the last word. It's yet another, sometimes particularly influential, moment in the dynamic process of legal change. And though lawyers and their clients succeeded in Papa Christu, and their success was real, I don't want to understate it, I'm going to talk more about it in a minute, it was not complete. In part, this was because there were many groups who were left out of the invalidations of vagrancy laws even as they were happening. There was no wholesale acceptance of the arguments that people out of place were making that they should be allowed to have new places or, be, uh, uh, or not to have a place at all if they so chose. And in particular, the dismantling of vagrancy laws did not increase toleration for uh, gay men and lesbians. In fact, it could be said to have further entrenched the public re regulation of sexuality. In part, but only in part again, I'll talk about this again in a minute, the partialness of the success resulted from the way the Supreme Court invalidated vagrancy laws. Justice Douglas considered saying that vagrancy laws violated constitutionally protected rights to dissent, to nonconformity, a constitutional right to live a life of high spirits. The rhetoric was amazing. Uh, and apparently, uh, it was the opinion that Justice Douglas asked to be read at his funeral. He was so proud of it as a kind of anthem for the 60s. He was, uh, he was a big fan of the 60s. He was quite old by the time the 60s came, but he fixed that by marrying several 20-year-old wives. Uh, so over the course of the vagrancy law challenge, in addition to the possibility that, that the uh, laws would be struck down because they violated constitutional rights, there was the suggestion that status crimes would be unconstitutional, that by making uh, someone's status the trigger for, for criminal liability, that that should be unconstitutional. But that's not what the Burger Court said either. What the court said in 1972 was what uh, Anthony Amsterdam had suggested more than 10 years later, that the law was too vague. And that meant that legislature needed to write more specific laws that would tell both people and law enforcement what exactly was illegal. That meant that legislators went back to the drawing board and identified more specific types of people and more specific types of activities for regulation. So you saw new laws targeting potential criminals, uh, loitering with a criminal purpose, drug possession laws, stop and frisk laws, traffic stops, increased use of traffic stops. You see also new laws targeting the homeless, prohibiting things like sleeping on park benches or sleeping in parks or aggressive panhandling. Policing also migrated to existing laws that seemed like they might be better poised in vagrancy to comply with the Constitution. Laws prohibiting prostitution, public drunkenness, disorderly conduct, breach of the peace. And law enforcement also constructed new forms of both civil and criminal law to address and further new developments, things like the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill, which happened right around the same time that the court undermines the use of vagrancy laws uh, uh, for dealing with mentally ill people on the streets. There's also the increase in drug traffic, and especially of crack cocaine, together with the ra rise in gang violence that leads to new gang loitering laws. And there's, of course, the retributive turn in criminal justice, which meant heightened criminal penalties and overcriminalization 
in many areas. In addition, as if you're not already deadened by what changed uh, uh, after uh, 1972, there are all kinds of non-legal me mechanisms of keeping people in particular places, or actually many of these mechanisms are meant to keep certain people out of other particular places, um, which also proliferated and deepened. Things like suburbanization, exclusionary zoning, white flight, and gated communities, urban renewal, federal housing subsidies, and the placement of federal highways, and things as mundane as anti-homeless technologies, like benches with armrests all across them to make it impossible to lie down. So I started with the question of how legal change happens. How over a 20 year period does a category of legal regulation that's been around for centuries become illegitimate? And that's the question I have spent the last several years answering. But the book attends, at least in small part, to the final question that emerges out of this post Papa Christu history. What does it mean that new forms of regulation proliferated after vagrancy laws lost their legitimacy? Does it mean nothing changed? And if something changed, what was it? I have spent years avoiding those questions, as some of you may know from prior workshops. I'm just kidding. I have spent years cogitating about those questions. It would take another whole book to do them justice. Uh, once the vagrancy regime is gone, it leaves in its wake so many fragments that, difficult as telling the story of its demise is, it is at least easier than telling the story of its aftermath. But I will at least gesture at the answers to those questions in the book and here. So here are my tentative thoughts. The beginning of the answer to the question of what the change in constitutional status of vagrancy laws meant has to return to methodological issues. And here, at the beginning, I feel quite strong and certain about my conclusions. Just as I intend this book to offer a form of constitutional history that crosses boundaries by including many more actors than usual, I realized early on that the book needs to cross other subdisciplinary boundaries within history as well. Parts of the story of vagrancy law and its downfall have been told, but it has never been viewed as a story. It's always multiple, fragmented stories. In part, the fragmentation of the story results from fragmentation among scholars. A colleague of mine likes to say that everyone tries to own my story to make it part of whatever their own intellectual framework might be. And that's easy to do because parts of my story fit into so many different places. Scholars have divvied up the cases in a variety of ways by litigant, civil rights protester, skid row alcoholic, soapbox orator, by constitutional claim, free speech, equal protection, criminal procedure, privacy, by historical subdiscipline, race, labor, poverty, sexuality, politics, geography. But no one of these perspectives, no single scholarly vocabulary can account for the story of vagrancy law. A history of vagrancy law as such becomes visible and possible only once one recognizes, as the litigants, lawyers, scholars, judges, and legislators did of the 1960s, still partially did, that despite different emphases and vocabularies, vagrancy cases shared a common insistence on either one's right to make one's own place in the world, the faultiness of the whole idea of place, or both. Just as identifying this common claim enables the construction of a narrative about the transformation of vagrancy law, so too it facilitates the telling of the legal history of the long 1960s. Social and cultural historians have recently started calling the 1960s a movement of movements, overlapping social change movements that are somehow related but not necessarily entirely related. But there isn't much law in those histories of this movement of movements. And legal histories of the period tend to be narrow biographies, case studies, stories of specific litigation campaigns. That's understandable. Telling a legal history of the 1960s is too unwieldy and too sprawling. In fact, subtitling this talk, A Constitutional History of the Long 1960s, is the first time I've even begun to think maybe it could be that, but most of the time I think it can't uh, entirely. The lens of vagrancy law, however, does enable me to integrate the history of the long 1960s while still attending to differences among different marginal groups and their interactions with police power. It shows how law functioned to expand cultural pluralism and tolerance within limits. It shows the growth of a national legal culture intruding on, national, on local norms within limits. It shows recognition that law enforcement, as much as other parts of government, engaged in the kinds of discrimination and rights violations that 60s social movements condemned, and that the same social movements condemn police behavior and police regulation of people on the streets for who they are as well.
Vagrancy law as a lens into the 1960s thus unifies without flattening once one gets beyond the multiple and fractured stories and sees the history of vagrancy law on its own terms. So what is this methodological point that my history of vagrancy laws and my legal history of the 60s through the lens of vagrancy laws is only made possible by taking vagrancy laws and on its own terms, not limiting it to any single academic framework, crossing disciplinary boundaries? What does that have to do with what actually happened in the law and in the world after the Supreme Court struck down vagrancy laws in 1972? My answer is a lot. Our lack of a single narrative and a single scholarly vocabulary, our failure to treat the history of vagrancy law as an integrated whole rather than an adjunct to some other history, has led us to misunderstand both the nature of the vagrancy law challenge and the nature of vagrancy law regulation. As to misunderstanding the nature of the vagrancy law challenge, the proliferation of forms of regulation after 1972 has meant and been accompanied by a fragmentation of social movements. Each group challenges the particular regulations that affects its constituents. Homeless advocates challenge panhandling laws. Defense lawyers challenge gang loitering ordinances. Looking backward from this fragmentation, it has been hard to see that there was a time when they shared a challenge to the vagrancy laws that affected all of them. I don't want to overstate it. It's not not, as I said, the brown model of a single litigation campaign, but they had a common target, they had a common forum to challenge that target, they had common legal arguments to marshal against it, and they did talk to each other and share information and think about this as part of the same challenge. The end of the vagrancy laws and the proliferation of other types of laws meant a fracturing of this social movement target, and it meant an eclipse of this shared legal history that has been hard to see since. Even more sig significantly, our lack of a single narrative and scholarly vocabulary has led us to misunderstand the nature of vagrancy regulation itself. Some people look at the proliferation of forms of regulation as replacements for vagrancy laws and conclude that nothing much has changed. The challenge to the vagrancy laws are for naught. If not vagrancy laws, then these others, and there's no real difference between them. Some part of me agrees with that. I'm torn between my intellectual instinct, which is to take a critical stance, a pessimistic stance, a stance that says that mechanisms of power shift rather than truly change, and my personality-driven instinct, which is optimistic and liberal, <laughs> a stance that says that changes in the law are meaningful in the world. And if I didn't think that was true, I probably wouldn't have pursued this project in the first place. But focusing on methodological boundary crossing offers a path through these two possibilities. And I think it shows that in three important respects, reconstructing the multifaceted history of vagrancy law shows real, if still partial, change. In order of ascending importance and descending certainty about the claims, uh, here they are. And this is uh, it, it, the end. Uh, first, though some of the uses of vagrancy laws have been long known, many have not been, and most have not been seen together. Identifying the constant and hidden and dynamic hidden ways that vagrancy laws were used shows what Papa Christou changed. New regulations have more transparency, and that changes their substance. It is no longer possible to hide behind vagrancy laws, which meant that legislatures had to be more obvious and more transparent about their goals and the means for achieving their goals. No one was, uh, 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 no, no, the wool was pulled over no one's eyes when anti-panhandling ordinances are passed or anti-sleeping in the park. Everyone knows who the target is, and that was not true um, uh, before. You can no longer fly under the radar screen and simply turn vagrancy laws to use against any new threat that arose. One had to stand up and identify the threat publicly uh, uh, and identify the need for and the mechanisms for containing it. And that's very different from the vagrancy era. The second reason why crossing methodological boundaries undermines the argument that these new forms of legal regulation were simply replacements for vagrancy laws is, and it's related to the first point, that nothing can replace vagrancy laws. It's not just the political process that differs today, but the actual legal landscape. It's in the very nature of vagrancy laws that they cannot truly be replaced except with other vagrancy laws or similarly vague laws. They were ubiquitous, they were protean, they were everywhere, and they were hidden. They did a lot of work very quietly. They also did a lot of work in legal arenas with very few procedural protections. Um, I'm not going to say that we now have a perfect criminal justice system. I don't think that's true. But the stories that one sees that I think were systematically true uh, in the vagrancy era 
was stories of police courts where 60 people would be walked in at one time, they would be told to stand up, the judge would charge them all with vagrancy, he might look around and say, you there, you're, you're in a suit, maybe you have a job, and maybe let that person go, and then say about the rest, off to the workhouse. 60 seconds, 60 people in, in prison. Um, and in fact, at one point in Philadelphia in the mid-1960s, there were more people in the workhouse, confined to the workhouse in Philadelphia for vagrancy, than they had listed as being convicted of vagrancy uh, uh, in the judicial records, right? So there wasn't particular care taken uh, to ensure that process was followed. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that care is always taken now, but I think that there is a, a difference in the level and, uh, and extent uh, of the few procedural protections that existed with regard to vagrancy laws at the time time. So the various laws that I talked about above are all only partial replacements. No matter how hard they try, and no matter how many of them there are, they cannot do what vagrancy laws did, precisely because they have to be specific and obvious where vagrancy laws were broad and hidden. Third, finally and most tentatively, I don't even actually think that we should think of these forms of legal regulation, or at least some of these forms of legal regulation, as replacements. I think we should think of them as vestiges. Vagrancy laws were so ubiquitous, they were so deeply entrenched, and they were so invisible that they were never really eliminated. I like to think of it as a splintering rather than a disintegration. And as a splintering, you have the splinters remaining. So there are still specific loitering laws on the books, the kinds I mentioned before for criminal purposes, for prostitution, for narcotics trafficking. There are still uh, um, uh, laws that require one to account for one's presence and identify oneself. I still get calls from practicing lawyers who uh, find traditional vagrancy laws still on the books in the cities in which they practice, uh, and they call me for advice, though I'm not a practicing lawyer, I don't give any legal advice. Um, but uh, but it's, it's remarkable because the same things are still going on uh, in some places, and once the prosecutors realize that the constitutional challenge is on its way, the charges are dismissed, which is exactly what happened in the 1960s and 70s, and was one of the reasons why it took so long for the court uh, to get a case. Um, and there are still cases in which laws that were long ago in validated continue to be enforced. All this points, I think, not to replacement, but to continuity. Vagrancy laws, very ubiquity, made it hard to dislodge. And that was especially true, and this brings me back to my methodological point, without a workable vocabulary, either historical or legal, for understanding all that vagrancy law did. In this sense, the decision to use vagueness and not necessarily use status crimes or a rights-based approach in Papa Christu is not necessarily to blame for the proliferation of post-Papa Christu laws. It's not clear that there was any real single way the court could have used to formulate the problem with vagrancy laws that would have undermined them completely. The lack of a vocabulary made parts of vagrancy laws work invisible and all of it widely. The fact that parts of vagrancy laws have continued then and that we have added on to other parts is perhaps a result of lacking the language needed to identify and eliminate the problem. At my most optimistic then, it's not that I think that 1972 represented a successful triumphant end to the vagrancy law story, it is that I hope that my efforts to put together the many pieces of that story can become part of the story itself. By beginning with folks like Isidore Edelman and Margaret Papachristou, rather than with a single Supreme Court opinion at the end of the process, we can see the whole landscape and organically formulate a vocabulary of vagrancy law. Now that we can reconstruct vagrancy law's own history in language not limited by any one aspect of that history, we can hopefully see fully how it functioned in the past, how it continues to persist today, and perhaps how we need to think speak and argue about it in order to further dislodge it in the future. Thank you. <laughs>